What's up everybody? This is Ben Lampkins with Angler's Itch Outdoors. Uh, we're out on the water today. Uh, we're going to be out here looking for some gizzard shad. Um, we're going to kind of talk about a few things for uh, maybe kind of like a quick basic way of uh, catching these shad. Uh, first thing is um, you're going to have to learn how to throw a cast net. Throw it consistently. Be getting out on the water, locating your shag, getting your boat positioned just right, and go to throw your net. And it doesn't open for you, and you got to start all over again. So it's a lot of time and energy wasted. So you want to make sure you get consistent with throwing that net. Just got to practice throwing one. Um, I was horrible at it at first. I was frustrated with it, but I kind of stuck with it. Kept practicing. Uh, you may have to do the same if you're new. Just get out there in the yard, start throwing that net. There's uh, different ways of throwing them. Uh, I tried a few different ways. I didn't care for some of them until I finally found a way that I liked and it worked for me. Once you find a way you like and it works, just kind of stick with that and you'll stay consistent. Um, you know, so uh, uh, I kind of started in the middle size-wise range of throwing nets, uh, around seven, eight foot-ish. Uh, it's a good place to start for me. Some say start small, but uh, some of those small nets, you kind of use different methods of throwing those smaller nets than you would bigger ones, so you're not really learning how to throw uh, the big ones, which is really what you're going to want to do for the most part, especially right now we're doing it in the uh, late fall and winter times. Uh, you're going to want bigger nets. Uh, fish are, if them shatter down deeper, you're going to want a net that opens up pretty good for you. Uh, it sinks fast, so uh, I'll get into more detail with that uh, maybe on another video. But today we're just kind of covering the basics on on what we look for uh, in a body of water. Um, obviously, the first thing you want to look for or do research on is finding out if that body of water you plan on going to has a good population of shed. Obviously, you don't want to be going out somewhere uh, throwing that net and exhausting yourself. You're not just not coming up with any bait. Uh, that can be frustrating or if you plan on a trip you want to hurry up and get some bait you don't want to be out there on a place that just doesn't have it so um, and then when I get to a body of water uh, usually like one of the ones I go to I already know where the schools of shad are before the boat even hits the water because all I do is look for what the birds are doing that's the very first thing I can see those birds from the road uh, this road comes through you can kind of see it's like a bridge which I'm actually going under it right now uh, when I go over that bridge I look out and I can see the birds all over dive bombing these big schools of shad and uh, that's before the boat's even in water so I know where to start if I need to um, some some places that you may go to that don't have a lot of that bird action you're gonna have to kind of rely on your electronics a little more but uh, those are usually a good starting point where the birds are at they'll tell you uh, right now I'm actually watching a bunch of birds fly over here uh, see if I can kind of show you that so you can kind of see them just flying around they know where they're at we'll see if we can find some uh, dive bomb in some of these schools but um, they're hanging out here for a reason they know where they're at they're just flying around waiting for me to leave because I want to start picking away at these so uh, that's a good starting point um, but again if you don't have the luxury of the birds for some reason in your area then you're just gonna have to use your electronics so um, but I, I can already see we definitely got shad under the boat here so I'll start showing you what they look like on there so all right guys I got them here on the uh, electronics I'm gonna turn the camera around and show you um, but that's just shad just schooled up down there. Thick, thick. Once the boat kind of settled down, you start seeing shad flicking everywhere. So. And obviously they're just down there thick as can be. Um, we're gonna go ahead and throw on these. And we're set up on a pretty big school here, so. I'm actually gonna use my smaller net just cause it looks like they're so thick in here. Uh, I don't want to get a bunch more shad than I need. It ends up being kind of a mess. I can throw them all, so. 
this all set up here. All these birds can't wait for me to leave so they get back on their school, but it's all right. So let's get our mitt ready. Alright guys, first throw, you can beat that, look at all the beauties, see what those birds can do for you, enough shad here for a while, so uh, some big ones in there too. Oh, here I like to drop them in. Oh, straight, straight in there. I'm gonna try not to handle them with your hands too much. That's why I got this tote here. It's kind of why I like if I can throw a smaller net when they're this thick. It's a little easier to get the shad all in there, just like that. If you don't have the birds and things, like I say, you gotta use your electronics. There's a few other things you can kind of look for. Um, uh, big chunks of rock or concrete, they like to hang around. Uh, girls algae and things like that that they like to feed off of boat ramps are a good place. Uh, obviously you don't even need a boat, you just throw off of there. Um, uh, but it is uh, like winter time. Uh, they say you got to go deep, which isn't necessarily true. Uh, the, these are, it's 20 foot deep here. The shad cloud so thick, it's all the way from 20 foot all the way up to 10 foot cloud of shad. So they're just 10 foot down here. Uh, I've even been here on some of the coldest days and caught them in two foot of water. So uh, don't necessarily always have to go really deep. Um, but if you have to, if you're in that situation, uh, you're going to want to use a bigger, faster sinking net, maybe even a tape net. Um, but if you get them to them thick like this, that's why I like having a few different nets for different situations. Just throw a smaller net, you don't need to catch more. If I were to throw that 10 foot net with as thick as any, you'd have way more shad than you need to deal with. They get all over the boat, you know, and it can be a, be a mess. So try to catch only what you need. Uh, it's a lot easier. Uh, what I like to do is I like to put them in this, I kind of like my little staging bucket here. Because um, after you catch them, they've got to purge, drop their scales and things like that. That's what, when you go to transport them and trying to keep them alive, clean water is key to that. Uh, if you just go throwing them in something like this, and there's a little drum in there too. Uh, and just leave them in there, they're just gonna end up dying. So get them in there, let them purge. This is kind of like a simple method that I use when I'm just kind of wanting to go out, catch some bait, and uh, go fishing and within the next few days or a week. And um, we're gonna go ahead and put them right in the live well um, in the winter time like this, cold weather. That's what I like about it. It's a lot easier to transport them. They stay alive a lot easier. Um, and you can just kind of put them in your live well. Uh, when you start getting a little more uh, warmer weather, or wanting to keep them alive longer. More, I call it the more advanced ways. You're going to want to start getting into a little bit better, better holding tanks, uh, making making your own tanks round tanks. They've got to be round, uh, things like that. That that's more of a little more advanced, but uh, we can go over that a little later. Um, but yeah, as you can see, the shad are just absolutely thick here, and that's what I like about this winter time catching shad. It just uh, the amount that you get into when you do find them you, you can just catch all the shad you want um, as long as the body of water has a good good population of them that let's get that drum out of there 
They make good bait too, but I got enough. Chat. So we got them here. Uh, we're gonna get the live well pumping. All right, now that we got our shad, they're in here purging, dropping their scales. You don't want all that. They're gonna do it again a little bit in the live well, but we want to try to keep it clean as possible so they survive. Uh, they'll survive the trip home. Um, we can get them to our holding tank at home so they can sit in there and wait for the next fishing trip. So um, let's go ahead and get this. I'm gonna get this live well plug put in. What I like to do is uh, bring some salt. This kind of helps uh, keep them last a little longer, helps them keep their scales on. I think it helps with their slime and stuff like that. So, this bucket here, I keep. This is just a bucket of salt that I carry. This is a uh, I think this is like water softener salt that I use. I'll throw some of that in there. It'll kind of help once you get them out of the out of your holding bucket there. Get them in a little bit fresher water so it'll last for you. I'm gonna try not. These are all good size. Like, you can't beat that. Uh, it's probably, there's obviously more here than I even need right now until I start getting into building more bigger tanks for holding them for much longer. Uh, but yeah, just, I just carry this little net. I just want to try not to hand them with your hands. Uh, we're filling up. We got some salt. Uh, I just throw uh, a few handfuls in the live well. We'll get a little more specific with the salt when we get to the holding tank at home. Talk about things like uh, the wind. I would say uh, the wind will blow the plankton and things like that. Uh, yeah, wind will blow the plankton up against the bank. You want to go off. Shad will be up on that side of the bank, which, uh, yeah, that's that's true to a certain degree, but it's how, how long has that wind been blowing up against that bank? Because it takes time, especially in a large body of water, for that wind to push all that plankton to one side or the other so you just want to kind of pay attention how long it's been blowing against that bank um, uh, if you get there and that wind shifted within the hour or something and you, you're getting there throwing and it just doesn't seem or, or you're scanning your electronics you're not seeing them on that windy side it's because maybe that wind has been blowing the other direction for a while so I use my hunting app that I have shows me what the wind directions have been doing for the whole week pretty much but uh you know i like to keep an eye on what that wind's doing if i need a uh, need to go that route and use those some of those uh techniques i guess you could say on where to start for finding these shad and uh but today was pretty easy uh i like to come out here when it's maybe a little harder uh trying to kind of show you maybe on electronics uh what to look for in some of those things uh, chunk concrete things like that boat ramps because uh, i like to feed on them also in the winter time you got good chunks of concrete or whatever they actually heat up or warm up i should say from the sun if it's a nice sunny day been sunny all day that a concrete can absorb some of that warmth and they'll go kind of around it you know one degree makes a big difference in the water one two degrees can make a big difference to a fish on uh, on where they're going to be for in the winter time so um, those are kind of the things you can look for bridge pillars uh, let's see if I can show you like right here these big concrete bridge pillars they like to hang out around things like that usually bridges are a good starting point uh, which is where we're at today um, and uh, today they're just uh, absolutely thick so I try not to use my hands. Kind of be somewhat gentle with them. Uh, when, and when you start getting in the shad this thick, you can kind of start picking and choosing uh, what size you want and things like that. 
you start picking through and getting all the real big ones if you want, if you like the bigger bait. Um, but uh, if you don't, if you're not using it, throw it back in the water so they're there for next time. Um, but we got all kinds of sizes in here. I'm gonna put some. Some good ones in there. Let's see if you can see all those. A lot more than I need. I'll probably end up putting a lot of these back in the lake, but. It's a nice big one there. I've gotten into them bigger. I've gotten them into. 13, 14 inch shad, but uh, I noticed in the wintertime uh, the blue cat kind of prefer a little bit smaller bait. So, you don't necessarily need big giant shad. Uh, took some buddies out. Uh, a friend of mine caught, ended up catching a 70 pound blue cat on a piece of shad the size of a cracker. So, uh, definitely don't need huge bait in the wintertime. Catch them giants on uh, smaller baits. I'm gonna pick through here and get some of the, the bigger, better shad. This method that I'm showing you that it's going to the holding tank, letting them purge, going to the live well, and then just going on to the holding tank. I can get probably about a week out of them staying alive like that. Um, so uh, I don't get real technical with it if that's all I'm looking for. That's why I don't mind just put them in the live well and drive them home. I have like a, today I have about a two hour drive home. They'll, they'll last just fine in the winter time. I'll get them home, get a week in the holding tank. You know, so if I got a fishing trip coming up, I can just do it that route. Like I said, when it gets hotter or warmer out, um, keeping these shad alive does get a little more difficult. You're gonna have to kind of start getting into more, a little bit better setup than this. You're gonna, like I said, tanks have to be round. Uh, bigger tanks, some water flow, aeration, which I'm going to leave the uh, uh, aerator on on here in the drive home. It'll keep them going, so uh, it'll be enough to get them home, then we'll get some... Uh, those birds are having a field day out there. We'll get them uh, in that fresh water at home in that holding tank, and then we'll be ready uh, to go fishing with turn these shad into some uh, big catfish and the thing is with these uh, fresh shad that's that's the key to catching them big catfish is fresh uh, I learned I used to try dead shad all the time I mean it's, there's some some people say that it works for them but it can be hard to keep them on the hook uh, well, you can freeze them and use them but there's a you know a, a method that kind of helps with that you know you want to kind of damp them dry. It's a little bit of a process. Get them in a, a vacuum sealer. Uh, some guys can do that and they, they do pretty good with it, freezing it uh, if you have to. But I personally, I prefer them still alive when I'm cutting them. It, it just doesn't get any fresher than that. They bleed a lot better. Um, this is just the way I like it. So Learn how to throw that net. Get it to open consistently. Learn your bodies of water. Uh, with social media and all these sites and stuff, you can pretty much find out what, what bodies of water hold, hold shad pretty good. Or If you got one body of water close to the house, make a trip. You don't even have to bring your boat. Just pull up and see what the birds are doing. If you got a lot of birds in the area and they're dive bombing or just like here, they're just kind of hanging out. Sometimes they get aggressive and they'll just start dive bombing the water. But if you see a bunch of birds in a certain area, you just pull up, see it. You'll know that place has has some pretty good shad. That, that that's especially in the winter time when they're schooled up, real big and tight like they are right now. Uh, those birds will, will know exactly where to go, and uh, you'll know that body of water has it. Uh, I found out I had a body of water I used to go to a river by my house. It was a closer drive, and yeah, they were just hard to locate. It just wasn't a good population. It was a lot of snags. I was going through nets, tearing nets. That gets expensive. Um, 
and I would go two, three days without catching chub trying to find them where the water in the wintertime is so low in that river that you, you can't get to some of the creeks that you needed to and things like that. So I found out, find a good body of water. Even if it's an hour drive, two hour drive, like this is a two hour drive for me. I have another body of water that's a little closer. It's about an hour, but the ramp's closed from the drought right now. Everything's kind of kind of low, but you know, I'll come out here. It turns out that it's less gas money, less time. I'm not tearing up my nets. That gets expensive. I'm spending more money trying to go to that place close to the house than finding a good lake. Uh, it takes a little bit longer drive, but honestly, in the long run, it's it's less driving because I make one trip, you see one throw, I got all these shed, go home, I'll have them shed I, I can usually keep alive for a week in, in the little little holding tank I got uh, I know some guys got some pretty nice setups uh, that they can hold them for months uh, good aeration and things like that nice round tanks uh, I'm thinking about making one of those soon that way you you make one trip they say you make an hour two hour drive make one trip to catch fill up on 100 shed like this you you got a nice good big holding tank good moving water and things like that, good filtration. You can have shad for months all within one trip. As opposed to keep running to a place close to the house if you don't have a luxury of it being close to your house like I did. I mean, if you have to drive a little bit, so be it. I mean, these things might turn into a 100 pound fish, so it makes it worth a little bit of effort getting the right bait so you can catch a fish that big. So this is just as important to me. Um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of other baits out there. Uh, winter time I found that shad, fresh shad is the key, out, at least where I fish. I fish uh, Missouri, Mississippi. Um, I think the theory on it is is that there's that cold winter time, there's a lot of shad die off, that winter die, uh, die off that they, uh, the catfish start feeding on them heavy and that's kind of what their target target bait is. Yeah, you can catch them on other things. Uh, I've caught them on like Asian carp, cut Asian carp and things like that, but when it came down to the, the quality and quantity, I was finding, especially in the winter time, that fresh shad was uh, what was working for me. Um, and I just kind of like going, I like getting out, you know, uh, and you know, after deer season here, I, I've been in, hunting pretty hard since September, it's the end of November here. Um, I'm ready to switch gears, kind of start fishing, you, you know, you get kind of cabin fever or whatever after sitting around the house. I like to kind of change gears, start coming out here, getting the boat out, catching some shad, going after some of those big winter catfish. Uh. Okay, so we're back at the house. It's the uh, next day here. Got the shad in my little tank I made. i kind of show you my little setup here that I got. Uh, just kind of holds them here until uh, I'm ready to go do some fishing. Found a video, just kind of shows how to make one of these, but uh, just a pretty simple little setup. Uh, it's like a 100 gallon tank that I have here. I just have some filtration in it. Uh, you can kind of see in there. Got kind of stacks of different types of filtration, some lava rocks down in there. Those lava rocks help build up beneficial bacteria, it kind of helps keep the water clean. Um, I uh, just filled this up with uh, tap water from the hose. I uh, just kind of added this uh, this product here. It just kind of gets the uh, chlorine out, reduces stress. Uh, and then I add, add my salt in there. Uh, this is a pool salt. Uh, you can get uh, water softener salt. It just has to be a, a non-iodized salt. Um, I put about one cup per 25 gallons in there. Um, you don't want to overdo it. Uh, and then sometimes you get some thick foam on top. And uh, uh, what I do is I, uh, I just skim it out, uh, which I've been kind of, I'll just come out every once in a while skim it out. As you can see, it's, it's doing much better. A little bit of foam's not bad, but I find it's best just to skim it out. They make like deep foamers and things like that. Uh, but uh, I don't like breaking down the foam in the water. That can kind of put proteins and nitrates back in the water, which is not good. Uh, I find it best just to get it out of there completely. And eventually it starts to settle down like this. A little bit of foam isn't bad. So you can see they're happy and they're lively. 
Uh, water's nice and clean. Uh, and they're happy. Be doing good for the next uh, next fishing trip. So there you have it, folks. Hopefully this video kind of helps you out a little bit on where to start, uh, how to locate those shad, uh, kind of using those birds to your advantage, uh, and uh, especially for you beginners and things like that, uh, how I keep my shad uh, on the ready for whenever I want to go do a fishing trip. Uh, so hit that like button, subscribe, and we'll see you on the next one.